Let's step at the back. Okay, hello, my name is Gerard Van Bell, and I am a astronomer at the Lowell Observatory, and we have some uh, very exciting things happening here out at our Anderson Mesa site. We are actually, uh, you can see behind me, moving a one meter telescope. So telescopes of this, of this size, don't usually get moved, but we have specifically designed these units to uh, be able to be relocated around our site. Um, this is because the facility that we're at, the uh, Navy Precision Optical Interferometer, is a telescope made up of telescopes. And it actually matters where we put the telescopes down. If we want to change the zoom lens on the telescope effectively, we, uh, we basically uh, uh, position the telescopes either close together for a very wide field on the sky or far apart for a, a very narrow pencil beam on the sky. So we're taking this particular telescope and moving it to a spot where we'll be able to link it into the array. And uh, it's very exciting. It's the first time we've done a big move like that here at the facility with these telescopes, which are pretty new. Let me change that right there. Um, I've been using actually this particular telescope with a new instrument that I've been developing called Quizzy, uh, which is a bit of a tongue twister of an acronym. But this is a, uh, a, new, t a new instrument that uh, we've tested on the one meter. And actually tomorrow, we're going to take it from the site here and move it out to Lowell Observatory's 4.3 meter. So let me show you some slides on the Quizzy uh, instrument. Um, Let's see, let me push the right buttons here to share my screen. Da, 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 da. There we go, sharing the screen. Here we go. And so um, what we have here is uh, a few slides I'm going to show you about Quizzy. The Quizzy is called the, the Quad Camera Wavefront Sensing Stellar Speckle Interferometer. Um, it follows on its intellectual siblings like uh, Dizzy and Ritzy and Nessie. Um, all these things have that sound at the end. As far as being uh, speckle interferometers, um, I work with uh, a team of experts on this. Uh, I have Catherine Clark from Northern Arizona University and uh, Zach Hartman from Georgia State University. They're both in residence at Lowell, working with me. Um, also from NAU is David Trilling. Um, a colleague of mine from Lowell is Casper von Braun, and then Elliot Horch from Southern Connecticut State University is also contributing to this. Um, the earlier instrument, this thing called Dizzy, is uh, actually on the Lowell Discovery Channel telescope right now, and so tomorrow we'll take Dizzy off before we upgrade it to Quizzy. And this has been actually a very useful collaboration, uh, not just with Elliot, but some other people at NASA Ames and at Caltech. Um, and the Dizzy instrument has been very successful. It's been copied many times. So uh, there's, there's, like I mentioned, Nessie. Uh, there are certain other things on the big telescopes out in uh, Hawaii and in Chile at the Gemini telescopes. And so these things are uh, uh, being very successful. And so one of the things about Dizzy, though, is that um, it's, it, it has some things where we can upgrade it. In its success, though, what it does is it's able to get a big telescope, like the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Um, it's allow, it, it gets it to basically overcome the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, trying to look through the Earth's atmosphere is a lot like trying to stare at a coin at the bottom of a swimming pool. Um, you can kind of see it dancing around, and that's because there's these turbulent cells in the water, and the Earth's atmosphere is like that too. And so we actually, uh, this is why we get twinkles in the stars above us. And so what we do here is um, we try to accommodate that, and one of the things that we do is that we at least freeze out the turbulence. We, we run the shutter on the camera inside of the instrument very, very fast. So we do it between 25 to 100 times a second taking a lot of uh, very quick exposures. And um, what that looks like is what you see here on the right-hand side here. Uh, this is slowed down immensely, but you can see a uh, basically a very highly magnified image of a star that's kind of dancing around. The, the, the atmosphere makes its position move around. It also defocuses it and makes it into a whole, whole bunch of little spots on your, on your detector. And so we call those spots speckle, uh, speckles. And so each one of these speckles is something that uh, we try and uh, uh, collect. And so we do this really, really fast. Now, 
a conventional camera um, will actually take a slow exposure. And the net effect is to take all those uh, little speckle patterns and basically add them up on top of each other. And so this is what it looks like is um, you take all those things. And if you just basically stack them on top of each other, you get a big smearing effect. And, and that's a problem because then you lose the potential resolution of the telescope. A big telescope like the 4.3 meter, that's 180 inches, Lowell Discovery Telescope, it, uh, it has the potential to see very fine detail in the sky. But if the atmosphere is basically smearing everything out, that's, that's kind of a, of a problem. And so uh, in developing something like uh, Quizzy or Dizzy, we can actually try and uh, dodge that. So the way we do that is we mathematically analyze each one of those uh, instantaneous frames. And those are what we look at. And so this is called the Fourier transform. It's a special type of uh, mathematical analysis. And with the Fourier transform, basically if you stack those, you actually can take out the twinkle and you get these patterns in there that have the, the damaging effects of the atmosphere removed. And so watch my telescope go off into the distance. Um, and so uh, if you take that and then rebuild an image uh, after the, the turbulence has been taken out, you actually can t uh, get to very fine detail in the sky. And the effect that we are looking for is um, we have a science program where we look for little faint binaries, uh, companion stars next to brighter host stars. So um, our sun is kind of interesting. Uh, our sun does not have a, a bright or does not have any kind of stellar companion next to it. The biggest companion next to the sun is the uh, is the planet Jupiter, and Jupiter is a lot smaller than the sun. It's uh, uh, it's about a thousand times smaller than the sun, and so that's the biggest thing that's going on. But but other other stars out there, about half of the stars in the sky actually have a stellar companion next to them. So this. Uh, is something to look for and try and reveal. And so this is a good example of us finding one of these companions, which hadn't been seen before because it was so close to its host, we thought it was just one star. But then when you look at it in very high detail, you can actually kind of pick out this thing and say, oh, that's actually two stars there. So this is what uh, this quizzy box looks like that I've been working on. Um, and uh, I'm trying to step into the wind here. Let me turn this go. Um, so what we're trying to do with Quizzy is make it so that we make more use of the light. And so it's kind of a mess inside the box. Let me step through what it does. There's the light from the telescope that comes out and that light gets to get relayed from the uh, top of your, of your picture here. And it uh, goes all the way to the back end. And that back end is where we have a special camera that's trying to uh, sample a signal on the turbulence in the atmosphere. That's all it's doing. It's not actually doing any science. It's basically a housekeeping sort of thing, but it lets you get more detail out of everything that you see. Uh, meanwhile, we actually have uh, little optics that split off little tiny colors of the light. Uh, most of the light goes to that wavefront sensor in the previous slide, but uh, slices of color get all packed onto a second camera. And that second camera is where we actually take those instantaneous pictures. Uh, one of the things that we're doing, instead of having a single image now on a on a pic, on a uh, image frame, is actually we're going to put four of those colors in each of the four quadrants of a single frame, and so we're making more use of all this real estate, the CCD real estate in the sky. Um, we also have another optic that splits off the near infrared light. It lets the near infrared light uh, also go to a couple cameras where we repeat the same kind of thing, but in the near infrared. So we have this very broad swath of colors that we're looking at and being able to characterize stars. Uh, all simultaneously. So my my design philosophy here in coming up with this new instrument was, you know, it's very precious time when you're on a telescope and you're operating and you're looking at something on the sky. And so all of this light from the visible light to the near infrared light, all this light that's collected, make as much use of it as possible. Um, it, uh, it's not uh, uh, the cheapest thing in the world to buy additional cameras for an instrument, but once you've made that one-time investment, then every single night that you have on the telescope afterwards um, has the advantage of being able to uh, make use of those cameras down. So that's actually a good underlying design philosophy. So again, this is what the full layout looks like, everything mashed together. It's actually a pretty small box. The, the overall uh, square box to which the cameras are attached on the bottom is about 20 inches by 20 inches square. And so 
Um, basically, once I have a design, I then uh, put together put together the design in 3D, um, and then we built it up in the lab and uh, got that all put together. And then we came out to the site here after some lab testing. This is what lab testing looks like um, with the four uh, imaging uh, quadrants on the left-hand side. And then this sensor that tells us what the turbulence is doing is that that's that grid of spots on the left-hand side. And uh, we came out to our one meter telescope here that you just saw drive past behind me. And uh, we actually have achieved first light. So uh, we've got the, the first uh, fringes, as we call it, on the, the, the detectors. This is what it looks like out at the telescope. Um, we've actually gone ahead and removed it. It's in a warehouse right here, getting ready to go out to the Lowell Discovery Telescope tomorrow. But while it was on our one meter, we were able to look at some stars on the sky and actually um, get, as you can see on the left-hand side, we get the uh, four spots due to the four colors that we're doing the uh, science imaging. And then all the leftover light on the visible side is going into that right-hand image. And uh, the, uh, the near-infrared cameras are running on a different window. So that's uh, one of the things that's very interesting about running this camera now is that there's so much going on because we're being so efficient with collecting all the light that it's a real juggling act to make sure all the cameras are lined up and all the um, all the, uh, the the cameras are working in concert with each other. Um, there's some very nice electronics that were built for this by uh, Lowell uh, electrical engineer Mike Collins, who uh, makes it so everything runs in lockstep with each other. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, this is actually what it looks like out of the observatory. It's uh, that was a still image on the last frame, but this is what it looks like with the uh, actual images of the starlight coming through a turbulent atmosphere. Um, again, the camera is actually operating at quite a bit faster than what's being displayed, but uh, you're getting one one frame every few seconds here. All right, can I get to my next slide? It wants to be stuck on this video. All right, maybe if I just stop stop the share and move on to the actual presentation. Oh, there we go. I think it made my, made my, oh, here we go. Let's see if I can get back to my screen here because it did advance. So one of the things that we're doing right now is trying to run a, uh, a science program with the Dizzy and now Quizzy instruments where we're looking for, um, here we are, where we're looking for companions to low mass stars. And so this is why I have my shirt on today. I'm thinking about low mass stars today. Um, nearby our sun, with out to 15 parsecs, that's about 45 light years, uh, there are about 1,200 stars that are between half the size of the sun and smaller. And uh, these are called M dwarfs. And they are really the, the pervasive type of star in the universe. Uh, most of the stars in the sky are M dwarfs. And so we're very interested in characterizing these stars and seeing how often they are multiple. And so we have this survey called the Pokemon survey, the perva pervasive overview of companions of every M dwarf in our neighborhood. Um, we're looking for any companions in the sky. And so in the upper right-hand side, you can see an example of where we have found a little faint companion nearby uh, a brighter host star. And so this is taking advantage of the uh, very large size of the Lowell Discovery Telescope. The large size let us, lets us pick out fine detail in the sky. It also lets, it, lets us look for fairly faint things, so small, smaller, and smaller, smaller and smaller companions. And so that's actually pretty useful. Um, and so, uh, like I mentioned, we are on our way out to the Lowell Discovery Telescope. Actually, let me switch back one last time to show what that looks like. And uh, this is you know, this one meter telescope that just went by is actually, you know, it's a 40 inch uh, primary mirror on that. That's a pretty big telescope. But the LDT is even bigger. It's about 180 inches in size. You can see a couple people here in front of it um, for comparison. And uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty exciting to go out there and, and we're going to be bolting on the telescope uh, tomorrow um, and uh, uh, trying to get that working. We'll be doing commissioning time with Quizzy on the LDT by the end of this month. Um, so we've uh, 
been uh, juggling th things here at the Lowell Observatory um, with the whole uh, COVID pandemic. But as you can see, we're you know generally working in a masked sense and and gloves when we're around each other to make sure that we are taking care of ourselves and more importantly taking care of each other. And uh, and so we're making some progress. And you could see my colleagues wander past with uh, this one meter. That's another activity that's going on. Let's actually check in on them and see exactly where they've gone. I can maybe give this a shot where we can try and pull up the feed from my phone and see what we can see about them getting the telescope around the other arm of the array. Let me go ahead and open that up. Here we are. Okay. And let me stop the video from me. And hopefully I can get the video going here. Oh, I did exactly what I was not supposed to do. Here we go. Here's me. I'm going to be walking around to come over here. And let's see if I can switch my camera. Here we go. This is what the... Navy Precision Optical Interferometer looks like. It's a very nice site to be working at. We have uh, a approximately 15 acre fenced in area here inside of the 13 acre special use permit uh, that we have with the US Forest Service. And um, I can't even see where they've taken the one meter dome because they're all, all the way off the west arm, or sorry, east arm. So we, uh, we're kind of uh, getting that wrapped up. We're going to be sending the telescope to a ray center here, which is directly in the center of the frame here. You can see the north arm going off 250 meters that direction. Um, so uh, they've gone and hidden this thing on me. So we will have to see when they come back once they round the horn on the uh, on the east arm. So I'm going to switch back to my regular video feed here. Dun, 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 dun. All right, there's me. Yay. If I could just leave this telecon. There we go. Hey, that actually worked. Okay, so um, I'm actually uh, uh, through with my prepared slides, so I'm actually very uh, curious here to uh, get some questions. I'm already seeing some. I see a first one in here from Jim Davies. What, which stars will you be looking at first with the LDT? Well, so the work we'll be doing initially with the LDT is going to be the... Um, uh, we're going to be uh, trying to commission it. And so uh, that actually is quite boring. <laughs> so uh, what you do is you basically march through things you already know the answer to. So for example, we're gonna be looking at a whole series of uh, increasingly faint stars because we wanna establish what the sensitivity limit is of this new instrument. Uh, we've already done some of that while it was attached to the one meter telescope that just went by. But um, we, uh, we need to establish that now when, once we're on the bigger telescope on the, on the LDT. And so uh, we need to do that. Uh, another thing we want to do is test the ability of the instrument to actually split binary stars. So we're looking for very close companions. And you need to be able to get some confidence that uh, when you see something, or more importantly, when you don't see something, um, is that because nothing is there? Or is that because you're not sensitive enough to split a couple of uh, faint binaries? And so what you do is you actually try uh, to look at things that have the have a known answer, previous detections from previous instruments, and see if you can find those. And so you basically uh, try that out and uh, see if you get the same answer. Uh, and then at that point, you're ready for prime time to go on to actual science things. Um, and so we will be continuing to do a bit of work on this Pokemon survey I already mentioned. But um, one of the things that we will do is uh, we, we've actually more or less wrapped up the initial survey phase of Pokemon. We've actually looked at 1,200 stars in the immediate solar neighborhood because the, um, the efficiency of the Lowell Discovery Telescope is really good. Uh, it points very well. It moves very fast. And so we basically were able to knock out that survey uh, over the last couple of years. But one of the things we have done is we found some things. We found about 10% uh, more uh, binaries for these M dwarf stars than their previous video. So we're going to go back to those things and uh, revisit them. And so over time, you can actually see these two stars move around each other and you can map the orbit. And once you map the orbit, you can tell the mass and that kind of thing. And so we turn 
astronomy into astrophysics, you actually start to uh, tease out the parameters of the things you're looking at rather than just take a picture and say, aha, I found something. Let's say I have a next question here. How long are your observing runs on LDT? Um, so they're usually uh, a couple of nights, uh, sometimes up to a week in time. Um, we actually, when we first started this survey um, a couple of years ago, we are actually uh, in the very first semester because of just how scheduling worked out and um, the availability of the telescope was quite good because some of our partners had some things that hadn't shown up yet out of the site uh, for their work. We actually had a stretch of, I think over that semester, uh, like 17 nights, uh, which was a little unusual, but that's kind of the outer extreme that we had. That, I think that was a, a clump of 10 nights and a clump of seven nights. So that's how these kind of things um, get uh, get bunched up. Let's see, a question from Tom C. How long is the process from turn on when observing to getting usable data? Um, is it uh, instantaneous or does it take a lot of data massaging? So the observing itself, um, the, the instrument is pretty plug and play as far as activating it. Um, it has thermoelectric coolers on the camera detector heads that we have on the back end of the instrument, those four camera heads. Um, they take maybe five or 10 minutes to cool down. Um, the operations, uh, when we had the previous instrument, Dizzy, on the telescope, um, by the time we had gotten to uh, real kind of steady state operations, it was pretty streamlined. We would push a button and it would queue up a set of observations. And we actually very quickly capture data on a given object. We're not staring at things for many hours on end. For the brighter things, the open shutter time is, I kid you not, it's about two minutes. And then we're moving on to the next thing. Um, for fainter things, we'll do multiple two minute sets, maybe uh, five sets, seven sets, nine sets, but then we're done. Um, and so the, the real rapid pointing and the, the superior nature of the pointing on the LDT has really been instrumental in making this happen because we've been able to just kind of hop around the sky in a rapid fire fashion. And we're doing 100 targets a night, maybe 200 targets a night um, of just moving around really quickly. And so um, if that was all bright targets, we would be, be probably be even faster than that. But uh, yeah, it's, pretty ama it's, it's a really amazing telescope. Um, as far as once we're done, the post-processing can actually take quite a while because uh, we're getting this data at video frame rates. Uh, and so we get uh, each two minute cube of data is actually a thousand snapshots all smushed together. We call that a cube of data. Uh, it's really just a movie. Um, and then we have computer codes that actually look at every single frame and stack them all and merge them all and then try to uh, pull out the presence of these faint companions. And so it can take a few hours to go through, um, in fact, up to most of a day to do uh, the processing of a night's worth of data. And so um, that's probably an area where we can make some progress and actually have some new challenges because our new instrument is going to have uh, a lot more data coming out because instead of two channels coming out of the back end like we had with the previous instrument, Dizzy, we now have six channels all at once, plus this wavefront channel that's telling us what the turbulence is doing. And so that's additional processing if you wanna actually fold into the turbulence, uh, fold, fold that into a, uh, a deconvolution of what the, the uh, true image on the sky is. So that's actually going to be uh, some interesting work ahead of us. I have another question here from Jim Davies. Can Quizzy be used to see faint galaxies? Um, that's hard, uh, and in part because um, Quizzy really hits a, a sweet spot in terms of the brightness of the things we're looking at and how much spread they have on the sky. And uh, as galaxies get smaller and smaller and actually are the right fit for the field of view of Quizzy, which is a very small field of view. It's maybe two or four arc seconds on a side. That's the whole to total field of view of the, of the instrument on the sky. Um, uh, with galaxies that would fit into that small of a post stamp on the sky, they're really faint and they're below the faint limit of what Quizzy can do. A, a, um, a challenge with Quizzy is that you know you are working at video frame rates, and so you have to be able to. Uh, get enough light inside of a single video frame, basically about a 40 millisecond frame, to see what you're looking at. And so 
that ultimately is the fundamental limit. And so you can get down to about 15th magnitude on the LDT, but galaxies that are much, uh, that would uh, fit onto the frame at that size are gonna be much fainter than that. Let's see, question. David Connell says, is there a navid usage of Quizzy that I am able to share? Um, tricky question there. Um, so I have people that are very interested in doing science applications with Quizzy, and that includes myself looking at uh, the low mass stars. Um, the idea for doing the new design on Quizzy on including this wavefront channel to directly sense the turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere, um, I'm, it's not original to me. It came, uh, basically I've seen it implemented at the Air Force Station at Maui for the people there imaging satellites. And so that's what I'll say about that. So anyway, um, another question from Woody Phillips. Are you using existing software to process the images or software new as well? So for the time being, we're gonna be using the existing software that we have to reduce the, the images. And so that is a software pipeline that would take the speckle frames, these, you know, star these bits of starlight that are dancing around, and process it just by itself. Um, that being said, that does not take advantage, like I said, of this wavefront channel. And so we will have to write new software, or get new software that folds in this extra information that lets us tease more out of the imaging frames. Um, my, my colleague, Elliot Horch, had a, a student do some preliminary work on this with some simulations, not actually work with real data, but uh, some expectations of what the turbulence of the atmosphere does. And if you have the wavefront data, um, what's that mean? And the, the assessment there is that um, the potential there is you can see stars that are fainter closer in when you fold in this extra information that you're getting from the wavefront side in addition to just the, the speckle imaging side. And so that was part of the motivation in building all this was that it would improve the results and uh, make it so that our data is uh, even that much better in the, in the long run. And so for the time being, the, the plan is as such, which is we use the existing pipeline and we should get results that are just as good as the, um, the previous instrument, though in more colors because we're getting more colors all at once. Uh, and then on top of that, we can develop the new pipeline and once that is ready, we can go back and re-reduce things to even push it further. Uh, there's actually a pretty common thing in astronomy is to re-reduce data with better software and get actually new results out of these things. Let's see, Tom C asks, are we talking terabytes of data and how do you manage the data volume you are generating? Um, so we anticipate a given night of observing is going to be pr producing a couple hundred, maybe three or 400 gigabytes of data. So a good chunk of a hard drive. Um, and so uh, the way to accommodate that is to, uh, well, first of all, you compress things and you try to squeeze things down. That gets you about a factor of two. But uh, yeah, the, the idea there is uh, you buy lots of spinning hard drive space and, uh, and store it that way. Um, we, we anticipate on an annual basis, we're talking, you know, 10, 20 terabytes, which is a good chunk, but you know, you can, you can get hard drive space for that. So see another question from Jonathan Ward. Are there any plans to use this instrument on a telescope in the Southern Hemisphere? So uh, there are not immediate plans to use this instrument for that, though it is small and portable, like its predecessor, Quizzy, or uh, Dizzy, sorry. Um, Dizzy is notable in that it's been on the LDT, but it's also been on WIN down at Kitt Peak. Uh, it also went to Gemini North in Hawaii and also went to Gemini South in Chile. Uh, and so uh, Dizzy is well traveled. And uh, like I mentioned early on, it's well copied. Um, and so Dizzy doesn't have to travel to Chile anymore because they actually finally built their own copy of it called uh, Zorro down there, kind of a neat name. And at Gemini North, they built Alopeque uh, for the meter telescope there. They built Nessie for the wind, the three and a half meter wind. Um, and so one of the virtues of these sort of instruments is that on a scale of what it costs to build instruments for astronomical uh, facilities, it's pretty cheap. Um, those camera detector heads that are on the back side of the instrument, that's the expensive bit. That's uh, for Quizzy, all four of them, that ran about 250K. Um, but the optics box itself, 
you know, it was tricky to align and to get everything designed and everything put together, but um, the parts were about 25K. Um, and so it's pretty inexpensive to do that. You know, a, uh, a possible future would be for them to, you know, if, if people wanted to copy this design, they can use the same detectors they already own and, uh, and use that. So that looks like the end of the questions. I actually see over here, the uh, one meter telescope has just come back into the frame. I think you can see that. It's right about here, I think. And uh, it's moved right along. Very exciting to see that thing move. It's actually almost at its destination. It will be just, uh, it'll, it'll end up kind of just to this spot right here and on the other side of that, that uh, uh, rectangular building uh, is where we're going to uh, park it for uh, its more longer term use. And so that, actually, here, you guys want to see that. There we go. So that's been actually pretty neat to see that coming around today. Again, our first big move. Uh, that represents a journey of about two-thirds of a mile uh, at about walking speed, which is what you want to do when you're moving a big telescope like that. And uh, we're going to be turning around and moving a second one of those uh, later on this afternoon. So I really appreciate you all joining us. It's been a very exciting day, and it's been fun to talk about some of the work that we're doing here at Lowell. Um, I think with that, uh, I think we can call a wrap on this particular one. Uh, thanks for joining us. It's been been fun.